Let's do a thought experiment. I want you to close your eyes and imagine the city of San Francisco. Now go ahead, pause the video, and leave a comment about what you just imagined. My guess is that you wrote down the city's legendary housing units known as the Painted Ladies. I'd also guess that you never really wondered how these Victorians came about or why they are so synonymous with the image of San Francisco. Well, to be fair, San Francisco is home to many sites, most notably the Golden Gate Bridge, Alcatraz, and so on. However, this wasn't always the case. In fact, there was a time when San Francisco was rather abysmal, covered in old gray paint. It looked dull and drab, and this aesthetic was perhaps a reflection of a much deeper collective of problems, ranging from natural disasters to some rather unimaginable social policies. And yet, those colorful cookie-cutter Victorians arose all the same. Join me to find out why, as today we discover the history of San Francisco's Painted Ladies. I'm your host, Ryan Sokash, and you're watching It's History. Part of the allure of San Francisco is that it's a city stuck in time, featuring architecture and infrastructure from different ages. From its historical Victorian buildings, to tall glass skyscrapers, to the cable cars of the 1800s, the city itself is marked by many historical events, such as being close to the epicenter of the gold rush, the devastating earthquake and fire of 1906, and the gay rights movement of the 1970s. But let's start from the beginning, when the urban landscape was completely different and the first known people of the Bay Area were a collective of 50 different Native American tribes. These tribes had a rich tradition of dance and music, basket weaving skills, and construction of sweat lodges. The Ohlone, as they were known, built their homes close to flowing water and made them out of poles, reeds, and grasses in a circular shape. These tribes were said to have occupied the region for up to 10,000 years before European colonization began. It all started on November the 4th, 1769, when the Golden Gate Strait was first signed by Gaspar de Portola, a Spanish explorer traveling with soldiers and missionaries. From there, the Spanish government set up missions and set out to forcibly convert the Ohlone to their religion. And hence, they were confined to missions in San Jose, Santa Clara, and Dolores. Despite the differences among tribes, the Spanish grouped them all together as so-called mission Indians, and either killed or forced them into working as slaves. In 1776, the port of Yerba Buena was officially founded, and by the end of the mission period, many natives died from forced labor and disease. But the Spanish occupation didn't last long. The Ohlone outlasted them as Mexico gained independence and claimed the port in 1821. Around this time, the Ohlone connected with the Miwok people and lived with each other in peace for many years. Mexican-controlled Yerba Buena hosted many American settlers looking to get rich from California's natural resources and instructed Swiss sea captain Jean Viaget to lay out the town's first 12-block street grid in 1839. Then, in 1846, American forces claimed it during the Mexican-American War, and a year later, the town was renamed San Francisco after St. Francis, the founder of the Franciscan Order. And a year after that, gold was found in nearby Sutter's Fort, kickstarting the gold rush. The port of San Francisco snowballed from there, used as a staging area for any gold miners looking to hit it big, Almost overnight, the small town of 800 residents grew into a bustling city of over 50,000 people. While the city offered economic opportunity for outsiders, many people living inside the eye of the storm had a rough life. The gold rush caused the prices of basic necessities to go through the roof, if you were even lucky enough to have one. There was also a severe housing shortage due to the sudden influx of thousands of people pouring into the city. As a result, San Francisco became infested with crime due to the lack of an established government and law enforcement. It didn't help that the fires of 1851 and 1852 destroyed much of the city, but much of it was rebuilt as changes were implemented to ensure housing security. 
In 1869, the Transcontinental Railroad helped spur economic growth in the city center, making it possible for people and goods to quickly travel to and from the East Coast. In 1870, San Francisco's first zoning law, the Cubic Air Ordinance, was proposed. The law required a minimum amount of space per tenant, and the space proposed was a minimum of an 8-foot cube. City officials said it would promote safer housing and improve quality of life, but ultimately, the law was weaponized, used to target Chinese boarding houses. This happened at the request of anti-Chinese labor groups that formed the immigration boom during the gold rush. As a result, hundreds of Chinese residents were arrested and packed into tight cells that violated the very law that they were arrested for allegedly breaking. And yet, this was only the start of predatory zoning laws that favored Euro-Americans. According to those affected, when neighboring groups, city councils, and politicians proposed or supported new zoning laws, they used the term local control as a euphemism to make it sound like they cared about the city's people when they were really pushing their own agenda. Time and time again, they used their so-called local control to increase segregation, preventing the redevelopment of low-income communities and kicking those residents out to make room for Euro-Americans. And things got nasty fast. During the 19th century, cities went as far as comparing Chinese borders to filthy hogs to support their arguments against urban tenements. And in the 1880s, the city further expanded its regulation of buildings, banning the hazards of public laundry facilities, which disproportionately targeted Chinese businesses along the way. However, this law was eventually struck down by the Yik Wo v. Hopkins Supreme Court decision in 1886, finding it to violate the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. Even so, this was not the last time California stole homes. You see, when California became a state in 1850 through the Treaty of Guadalupe with Mexico, the only legal way for the federal government to take native tribal land was through treaties. That year, 18 treaties were negotiated and 8.5 million acres of land were designated for the Native Americans. However, when the treaties got to Congress, both of California's newly elected senators argued against their enforcement, a secret that was hidden in the U.S. Senate archives until 1905. As a result, California Native Americans never legally lost their land. And so a census was done to identify each Native American tribe and grant the right of sovereignty and government-to-government -government relationships. And as a result of this, the Ohlone people were not even recognized as a distinct tribe until 1927. In the mid-1900s, they were forcibly removed from their lands and relocated to other parts of California, resulting in many deaths. Even when confronted with clear evidence of wrongdoing, the Bureau of Indian Affairs denies everything. And so there's a distinction we need to point out. This kind of discrimination differed from the Jim Crow era laws of the South, as the government had to more strongly justify their lawmaking for subsequent discrimination. They tried to make it seem like the discrimination was for the benefit of everyone, even if it only really benefited the upper class. And then, as if an intervention from Mother Nature was overdue, on the early morning of April the 18th, 1906, a magnitude 7.9 earthquake erupted, multiple fires raged for several days. When all was said and done, 3,000 people were dead. 80% of San Francisco had been destroyed and 400,000 residents were left homeless. This was San Francisco's chance to rebuild, better and stronger than before, with plans from the likes of Daniel Burnham. And this is where the city set its sight on those famous houses you know from TV. But this was also the time when those famous painted ladies came a thing of value. You see, in response to the housing crisis we discussed, San Francisco had built 48,000 Victorian houses between 1850 and 1905. So there was a time when they basically made up the majority aesthetic of the city. But after that 1906 earthquake and fires, around 30,000 had been destroyed. 
And over the course of a few years, the city had to decide which residents were worthy of occupancy there. And the city started up with shenanigans right away. In 1909, a one-two combo of Supreme Court decisions allowed cities to keep industrial and commercial developments as well as low-income residents out of specific residential neighborhoods. By 1920, a new zoning ordinance established six major land use categories for residential, industrial, and commercial areas. In theory, the zoning would improve the lives of citizens by limiting the harm of industrialization. Yet according to most sources, it was used to keep poor people and obnoxious industries out of wealthy areas as the rich migrated to the city's suburban outskirts. This tool was used to keep undesirables contained in the city center and restrict them from entering the affluent neighborhoods. Now, technically, racially based zoning was deemed unconstitutional in 1917, but private developers and homeowners could legally put racist ownership requirements into their deeds, known as racially restrictive covenants. While not a part of city law, they weren't given a second look and allowed to function within San Francisco. These type of covenants were bolstered by banks, property owners, and even the Supreme Court when upheld in 1926 in the village of Euclid v. Ambler Realty decision. In 1934, as a part of FDR's New Deal, the Federal Housing Administration was established to ensure private mortgages. The FHA's handbook included guidelines encouraging cities to segregate neighborhoods racially and banks to avoid non-white areas. The FHA approved this process, also known as redlining, as a legal way to deny home loans to people of color and low-income citizens. At the same time, the federally sponsored Homeowners Loan Corporation was set up to help prevent the national issue of foreclosures during the Great Depression. Still, it once again discriminated against non-white areas as, quote, too risky of an investment. The Fair Housing Act of 1968 ended redlining, but the effects of its damage can still be seen today. In 1942, the city officially created a department dedicated to urban planning, hiring L. Tilton as its first director. His experience in suburban and car-centric development made him well-suited for the goal that they had in mind for San Francisco. Modern architects and housing associations at the time were also pushing for a complete redevelopment of neighborhoods to maximize efficiency without consulting with residents ahead of time. The city was considered a machine that needed old parts removed and replaced with brand new ones. And as you might imagine, the old parts were working class African American neighborhoods. They saw these neighborhoods as blighted, doomed to spread to other city areas, which from the perspective of the San Francisco government would have made them worse. Around the same time, California also passed the Community Redevelopment Act, which enabled cities to use the power of eminent domain to take land from poorer neighborhoods in the name of rebuilding them. When these neighborhoods were destroyed, their residents had nowhere to go, made worse by the segregation laws of the time, plus the inability to get a loan. Even celebrities like Willie Mays of the San Francisco Giants had trouble buying a home due to the racial tensions in rich neighborhoods. All that was left to do was fight for their community against the bulldozing that was taking place to build wider streets and freeways. In 1959, citizen activists won one of their first victories with a petition of 30,000 signatures, forcing the Board of Supervisors to cancel several planned freeway projects. And then finally, a new zoning code was approved in 1960 that sold that suburban fantasy for all residents, while allowing for limitless growth in the city center. Towards the end of that decade, San Francisco began to allow the designation of historic buildings and districts right when hundreds of Victorian houses were being destroyed. The term painted lady refers to any Victorian building that is painted in three or more colors, but they wouldn't earn this moniker until later. The painted ladies of San Francisco are most well known as the iconic Seven Sisters on Steiner Street across from Alamo Square built by Matthew Cavanaugh between 1892 and 1895. But the label doesn't only apply to those seven houses. 
The Victorian era of architecture ran from 1837 to 1901, defined by incredible heights, steep roofs, bay windows, and ornate balconies and porches. Thousands of these houses were created, especially during the height of the Gold Rush era, as a way to flaunt the wealth from all the money coming into San Francisco. Victorian homes are generally constructed with craftsmanship and materials that cannot be recreated, which makes it even bigger a shame that so many were destroyed during the turn of the century. And you might be surprised to find out that many of them provided low-income housing for most of their lives. These Victorian houses weren't appreciated in the city until that horrific earthquake. Critics viewed them as a garish mix of architectural styles. Afterwards, Victorian neighborhoods were considered part of the inner city, the part of San Francisco that the wealthier class was trying to run away from. And that low-income image was only exacerbated around World War II, as they were perfect candidates to become overcrowded boarding houses for migrants looking for work in the defense industry. These old, decaying buildings had their best features. Their wooden ornaments, iconic columns, and intricate wood trim simply ripped off and painted over with a surplus of battleship paint. The city was gray and drab, much like the mood of that era. When World War II came to an end, the only residents who remained in Victorian houses were low-income minorities, African Americans in Fillmore, the Japanese in Japantown, Filipinos in Soma, and Latinos in Mission. They were the perfect target for urban renewal and freeway construction because they were poor and disadvantaged. Areas like Soma and the Fillmore were hit the hardest with thousands displaced to make space for the Geary Expressway in the Moscone Center. Hundreds of Victorian structures were demolished, with the city losing decades of architectural heritage and negatively impacting Black and Filipino communities. But when the 60s came about, something interesting started to happen. The counterculture movement began to pick up steam, based on the belief that peace and love was the answer to the world's problems spurred by the beatnik movement of the 50s and the mind-altering drugs of hippies, counterculture found its foothold in the district of Haight-Ashbury. By 1967, the Summer of Love brought thousands of young, like-minded people to San Francisco. A center of progressive politics and social change began to form, and soon, San Francisco's culture of tolerance began to attract many people. Gay men in particular saw the city as a home free of persecution, and in turn wanted to give back and beautify the city. Hence, San Francisco's community of gay men actually played a major preservationist role in neighborhood activist groups like the Victorian Alliance to Stop Urban Renewal Plans. Alamo Square, where the Seven Sisters stand, was saved by groups like these. With their preservation also came beautification. From there, a new colorist movement branched out of the counterculture in Haight-Ashbury, fighting against the drab grays of the past. Artists like Butch Cardum, Jill Pilarazza, Bruce Nelson, and Bob Butcher painted tens of thousands of buildings, pushing clients to make their properties loud and proud. People started to see their homes as a canvas for self-expression. More and more people in the counterculture generation began to repair their Victorian homes instead of tearing them down, forging a strong, intimate relationship with these historic buildings. In the case of the Victorians, a strong balanced blend of bright colors was used to enunciate the architectural details of the era and highlight ornate trims and facades. In other words, San Francisco transformed into a collage of uniquely painted houses throughout the city. By the 70s, painted ladies were everywhere and inspired a 1978 book of the same name that actually coined the term painted ladies, San Francisco's Resplendent Victorians by Elizabeth Pomada and Michael Larson, celebrated the work of the colorist movement and brought even more attention to the homes. Painted ladies were seen as the essence of innovative and classic style. San Francisco Victorians cemented their place as historically and culturally significant when the National Endowment of Arts 
formally surveyed them in 1976. With only 13,000 houses left after the natural disasters and destruction, the price of Victorian houses skyrocketed. Overnight, their price quadrupled, becoming the hottest real estate in town. Soon, an industry was born out of sprucing up old Victorians for their new homeowners. However, their original tenants, the low-income minority communities, were rarely benefited from this business. Many of the Victorian homes had been outright destroyed in those areas, and the money needed to rehabilitate each home was simply out of reach. Controversially, the activists who were instrumental in restoring these homes were blamed for this outcome. In the 70s, gay men who moved into working class and POC neighborhoods were seen as blockbusters. People who prey on homeowners to sell low so that they can sell high. And this often harmed people of color with little opinion. Leading some to be ostracized in what was otherwise considered an almost liberal utopia. As slurs were slung at residents, some rather outrageous accusations were made about these blockbuster men being as quick and carefree with their relationships as they were with their investments. In contrast, others spray-painted stop white gay racism on the sidewalks of intermission. Things came to a head with the assassination of trailblazing activist supervisor Harvey Milk and the mayor of the city, George Masconi, by former supervisor Dan White. Despite this hardship and the following AIDS crisis, the community of men remained strong and ingrained in San Francisco, even as lower incomes were priced out. This was another transformation for the city, as low-income and POC families were also priced out of their Victorian homes and displaced into other areas. For context, a three-story, six-bedroom Victorian house that would cost $50,000 in 1970 can't be bought by anyone with income lower than six figures. So what was once an effort to revitalize the city's historic buildings turned into just another way to push poor people out. So with such a difficult past, how did these homes become a non-controversial icon of the city, especially in the modern day polarized political environment? Let's have a look. The Painted Ladies stand at the top of the list as one of San Francisco's most popular tourist attractions. The colorful sights have appeared in various media, from movies to TV shows and even video games. One of the first painted ladies to receive widespread media attention was the ever-transforming Rainbow House at 908 Steiner Street. Maya Peoples-Bright and her peers were constantly working on it during the late 60s. The author of The Color Purple, Alice Walker, famously owned 720 Steiner Street until the mid-1990s. Some movies the Seven Sisters have appeared in include Dirty Harry, the Conversation, The Invasion of the Body Snatchers, and so on. They were featured in the video game Watch Dog 2 and TV shows like a and Farm on Disney Channel and perhaps most famously, the opening credits of Full House. Arguably, that is where most people recognize the Seven Sisters from, bringing them to the spotlight and pop culture as early as 1987. That's why it's no surprise one of those very same houses located at 714 Steiner Street was listed for sale with a price tag of $3.5 million in 2022. The Seven Sisters line the steep slope of Steiner Street, also known as Postcard Row, a part of San Francisco admired for its extreme beauty, making it one of the most iconic and photographed spots in the city. Not long after its inception, their popularity gave birth to paint collections, specifically for Victorian homes, as they spread to every other American city. Most can be found in cities like St. Louis, Baltimore, New Orleans, and Cincinnati, which had similar architecture. But while the price of painted ladies climbs as high as their tall painted roofs, we can still appreciate the spirit of San Francisco they represent, a story of how low-income housing can become the face of an urban center. And we'll leave it there for today, but don't miss our other fascinating California stories by clicking the playlist right here. Otherwise, thank you all for watching and subscribing. Until next time, I'm Ryan Sokash, signing off.